Saturn's rings are the most spectacular and beautiful things in the solar system. I mean, just look at them. And while it's not quite known exactly how they formed, we do know one mechanism that seems likely. Tidal disruption. See, for a given gravitational system, there's two forces at play. There's the gravity of the primary, in this case Saturn, which produces the orbital motion in the first place, and the gravity of the secondary, in this case a moon, that holds the secondary in one piece. And for a planet-moon system like the Earth's, these forces don't really fight each other. The gravitational force of the primary is enough to keep the moon in orbit, but it's much weaker than the moon's self-gravitation keeping it together. But once a moon gets close enough to its primary, there's tension. Specifically, there's a so-called tidal force that the primary applies on the moon. In fact, it's this same force that causes the tides on Earth. The moon pulls harder on the water closest to the moon compared to the water furthest from it, so the water gets a little more of a tug. The end result is higher water levels. And this same process can effectively rip apart a gravitationally bound secondary if the tidal forces are strong enough. So let's do the math, and I promise, it's not scary. The setup is a simple one. We have two gravitationally bound spherical bodies, a primary and a secondary. We want to figure out when a piece of dust sitting at the surface of the secondary will detach from the secondary as a result of the primary's gravitational pull. So we have two accelerations to compare. First is the gravitational pull from the secondary on the piece of dust at its surface. This is given by the usual Newtonian formula. G is Newton's gravitational constant, little m is the mass of the secondary, and R is the radius of the secondary. Next, we need to know the tidal acceleration on the piece of dust. To figure this out, we need to know how much more the gravitational acceleration is from the primary at the surface of the secondary as compared to at its center. So again, we apply the Newtonian formula to find the accelerations. This is the acceleration at the center of the secondary, and this is the acceleration at the closest surface of the primary. Here, big M is the mass of the primary, and A is the distance between the primary and the secondary. To find the tidal acceleration, which is the acceleration the dust will feel relative to the surface of the moon, we just take the difference of these two accelerations. Importantly, the acceleration at the surface is ever so slightly higher because it's ever so slightly closer to the primary. Now all that's left to do is balance the accelerations and determine exactly how big the orbit should be so that the tidal acceleration cancels out the gravitational acceleration from the secondary. This will be the distance at which the moon can't keep its own surface attached to itself. If we assume the radius of the moon is small compared to the orbital distance, we can solve for the orbital distance, resulting in the so-called Roche limit. With some math magic, we can recast the Roche limit in terms of the radius of the primary and the ratio of densities of the primary and secondary. Now those computations obviously made some simplifying assumptions, but the general idea holds even if we make it more realistic. Regardless, the takeaway of all of this is that for a given moon composition, which informs its density, we can determine how close such a moon can orbit its primary without breaking up and turning into a ring.